Hey gang, and welcome back to another exam solutions walkthrough for the exam, OCHEM 2, exam 2. Okay gang, if you are here, that means you are probably getting ready for a test. So I just wanna say, good luck, you got this. But I'm guessing you're here because you tried the practice exam on JoChem for the exam that covers the content of, you know, carbonyls, ketones, alpha carbon stuff, enolate, enol, michael addition, Robinson um, aldol reaction, and carboxylic acid stuff. So if you're here for that, you're in the right place. Don't worry, this stuff can be tricky. Uh, and if you're here watching this video, that means you are putting in the work. So enough of my blabbering, you know the drill. We're gonna go through the worksheet that this walkthrough addresses. We're gonna go over the practice exam. We're going to see how I arrived at the answers that you've already seen. So let's go. Rolling into the first problem on exam two for OCHEM two. This is gonna be part one of two. We're gonna do the first four. They're complete the reaction question. Then we'll do the second four. So if we look at these first four here, we'll start up top. You can see just a regular old ketone, right? Cyclo uh, pentanone. And then we have this, you know, it's a weird little alcohol structure, but what I hope you're seeing is this is a diol. It's just a diol. And we have acid. This is acetal formation to a T. So, you know, you'll protonate the carbonyl oxygen first, you'll add, you'll go through the whole acetal formation mechanism. But we know it's this carbon right here. The carbonyl oxygen will disappear. We will make bonds to these two oxygens right there. So as a product, you can expect, and it's weird, but go about it very methodically. Know that these two bonds will go to oxygens. And it's just that these two oxygens happen to be attached to a six membered ring themselves. So you draw a line, you draw a line, that line is connected. And that's, I mean, it looks strange, but it's just an acetal formation, okay? Now, down to the second problem. So we obviously have uh, benzyl bromide and you can see our first step. Oh my goodness, whoops, sorry gang. Obviously, you can see where this is headed, right? We're throwing in magnesium. We're going to make a Grignard reagent as step number one. So over here, you can see we'll have MgBr. And then secondly, we throw in CO2. So you know this Grignard reaction, you know this Grignard reagent will attack CO2. And we know after the second step, I'm going to abbreviate the aromatic part of the ring. We just have this, you know, carboxylate, uh, anion attached and then we protonate it up to a carboxylic acid and that's my long way of explaining that you know we know that we can attack co2 with a Grignard reagent and we protonate it up you know quench that negative charge to make a carboxylic acid right that's one thing we saw in our travels with carboxylic acids so down here hopefully what you're seeing here is of course you see this is a cuprate right and we, you know, I mean, if anything else, we worked with cuprates only one time, and it, it, was, it was in the context of doing one four additions on alpha beta unsaturated carbonyls, aka, in this particular uh, instance, enones, right? Uh, alpha beta unsaturated ketone. So remember when you see this, I want you to think of whatever is inside here. You're only going to use one of them, and it's a less, it's a soft nucleophile version, right? of our organo, orga, blah, 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 organometallics, right? Obviously with the butyl, or with the uh, organolithiums and the Grignards, they're much, they're hard nucleophiles, they're more aggressive. The cuprates, they do the one, four addition. They don't do one, two additions. So we know the mechanistically, we have this flow right here. And then this enol, enolate piece you form here. Here, I'll even draw the product at first. Well, if I don't draw something weird, you initially form this, right, with the one, four system being one, two, three, and four. That's why we add on the fourth carbon. And we know that that enolate flips intolerance to its ketone, its keto, uh, you know, counterpart, you know, form. And that is the product we get. Just a generic one, four addition with a cuprate. And finally, down here. So this type of problem always tripped me up. It's because you you know you see base whether it's LDA NaOH T butoxide and you see a carbonyl here it's an aldehyde and I used to just think like what what is this what's the reaction nothing's you know jumping out to me as identifiable 
if you if you have that same problem as well, make sure to tuck Homo aldol in the back of your head because the first thing you're absolutely going to do is alpha depropanation. You're absolutely going to have the LDA grab H plus next door and then alpha carbon, and you're going to form an enolate. Okay, let me draw this. I'll draw this up here. But then, you know, if you get this far, then you think like, what next? I think I wasn't given anything to attack. And that's because you don't need to be given anything. You can attack another one of the original things given in the problem. So what I'll do is I will draw this kind of like that. And again, right, we can do a homo aldol where, right, alpha carbon attacks carbonyl. Just be careful. We know we're bonding from this carbon. That's the carbon controlling the electrons in that double bond. We know we're bonding to this carbon right there. And you can just assume that there's gonna be some workup, but we know, I'll even just draw the original structure right here. This is kind of going to be, this will be the enolate having re returned to its carbonyl form. And we know that this bond right here will have an OH on it. It's this carbon right here. And of course, first it will be an O minus, then it will be an OH. And that has two additional carbons off of it. So this is the product we get, and if you want to double check yourself, remember, aldol reactions form one, three hydroxycarbonyls, and we see an alcohol and a carbonyl three spaces away from each other. Okay, gang, that's the first part of problem one. Let's finish off problem one with part two. Okay, gang, for part two of problem one, again, four more reactions, but we got this. So if we take a look up here, one thing, and if I've been a broken record on Joe Kev, it's because it's so important. If nature, an acid-base reaction is the easiest, most favorable thing you can do in organic chemistry. So if we take a look up at this problem right here, we see a carboxylic acid and we see a ketone. As a first step, we see ethyl Grignard, a Grignard reagent. Grignards are wickedly good nucleophiles, but also wicked, wicked, wickedly good bases, okay? So this Grignard is given a choice. Does it attack the carbonyl? in the ketone, the carbonyl carbon, or does it just mercilessly rip off one of the H's in the carboxylic acid? And the Grignard does what is the fastest, easiest, most exothermic, favorable thing it can do. It does the acid-base reaction. Acid-base reactions are so fast, so easy, so favorable. So what happens here is the negative carbon in the ethyl Grignard, it just comes over to the carboxylic acid, it rips off H plus. So at the very, you know, after step one, we just get ethane, right? And if you want to think about it, what I'm showing right here is really this, but you can just as well write ET with a lone pair and do it that way. Now over here, we get this carboxylate, right? Ketone unphased, not touched. And then you get this O minus. And then you see we have a second step of acid. So that's why on the answer sheet, what you saw me do, this O minus would get protonated. You can either draw this, or you can have the O minus, that's fine too, or you could even just simply write no reaction because really you're just gonna have an acid-base exchange and really nothing of interest happens. Now I know like that things, obviously we had a proton exchange, but it's not like we made any new carbon-carbon bonds. It's not like we you know, changed the functional group from a ketone to an alcohol anything like, I mean, no reaction in that context. So just an acid-base reaction. Be careful if you're in a situation where an acid-base reaction can happen and you're thinking about, should you do that or something else? You're probably on the right track to thinking, I caught a sneaky acid-base reaction that someone was trying to slip by me, okay? Now, in this second problem right here, and I think, I, I believe, just forgot to put some H plus here, uh, we have a ketone and we have a secondary amine, right? That's so key to be able to quickly pinpoint whether that's primary or secondary amine because what's gonna happen here is we are doing enamine formation, not imine formation, right? So what we know is this, we will have a carbon-nitrogen single bond, and then remember, we need to choose which side, because this is asymmetric, what side we will have a carbon-carbon double bond. So we have our amine looking like this, now, what I hope you can see is this isopropyl group right here, if we locked it into place with this, there's no kind of way we can form a nice E double bond and kind of 
lock this away. If we lock this in place, we're going to cause some steric hindrance with the enamine that we're going to form up top. So it's actually the best thing to do um, sterically is form a double bond on the left side over here that I'm dotting in black because then we can flip this second carbon, the ethyl group, up while still allowing the isopropyl group to rotate freely, okay? Okay, and that's the answer for the enamine formation. Okay, now down here. As so you can see, we have a secondary, bro you know, secondary carbon with a bromide. And then in this first step, we just have potassium cyanide. So yes, I'm transporting you way back to OCHEM 1. This is just some plain old, good old fashioned SN2, CN, you know, cyanide, great nucleophile, not a strong base. So the first thing that happens is the carbon with the lone pair approaches from the back side. We attack our leaving group, a good leaving group, at the same time as leaving. So after the very first step, we just have a dashed CN, okay? And then we get to the second part. And here we, we, we leave that lovely time travel back to OCHEM 1, come back to our present OCHEM 2, and we realize, okay, now we're just gonna hydrate a nitrile. We know when we hydrate nitriles, we yield carboxylic acids. So what's gonna happen here is, let me make sure I lose any carbons. One, two, three, one, two, three. Still on a dash. And you can either draw it like this, or you could draw it like this, CO2H. Up to you, but I just kind of like this problem because it brings something way back that we spent so much time on in OCHEM 1, and you know, it's a nice easy pairing of that and an OCHEM 2 topic. Now, down here on the bottom, four steps, but we're just gonna take it one step at a time. Now remember, in this first step, and it's more like three steps because we start with the carboxylic acid, and remember the only reducing agent, the only agent that is strong enough to reduce a carboxylic acid is L, uh, lithium aluminum hydride, LAH. And that's what this first two steps are right here. This is our source of hydride, our very aggressive source of hydride, and then just something that's gonna pr provide some workup, acidic workup. So after one and two, let me just erase this. Oops. So after step one, we just have this. It's like we essentially wiped away the carbonyl. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, okay? Then actually in the third step, <laughs> So this is one, two. In the third step, we get our carbonyl back, but it's really like we just stepped it down to an aldehyde, okay? And then the fourth step, what I hope you're seeing is, you know, triphenylphosphine, we are definitely doing a, uh, a Wittig reaction. Sorry, that's a yilid. So not just any yilid though, notice that our yilid is off of an aromatic system, a conjugated system. So. Remembering Wittig reactions, we usually form a Z double bond, but here we'll be forming an E double bond. So remember, we're gonna be connecting these two dot carbons. You know, and if you wanna do the electron flow, oh goodness, hold on, P, H3. Remember, it's this carbon that is the negative one. It reaches out, it grabs the carbonyl carbon. This oxygen loves bonding to phosphorus. Oh, I didn't do this the way I really wanted to. Here we go, this would be better. It likes bonding to phosphorus. It will go down here and bond to it. So we get that four, you know, that temporary four-membered ring. And then it breaks. But the point being is that we have one carbon outside of our benzene ring. So the way we can even draw this and think about it, it's this carbon right here that it will be bonded with a double bond to this carbon right here that was a part of the aldehyde. And it is one of one, two, three, four carbons. Remember, it's an e double, e double bond. One, two, three, four. There's, there, you know, part of our structure that had one carbon in the aromatic ring. And remember, this is an e double bond. And in this particular case, we could call this trans. But remember, it's an e double bond because the pi the priority groups are not on the same side of the double bond. Okay, gang, that does it for problem one. On to two. Okay gang, problem two, nothing mind blowing. In this problem, we're given a structure and we are given two types of conditions and we are tasked with predicting either the thermodynamic or kinetic enolate 
based on the conditions, you know, where appropriate. So we know smaller bases and warmer temperatures yield that more favorable, more substituted double bond, AKA the thermodynamic enolate, right? So if we are to look right here, we know the thermodynamic enolate, whoa, I am not drawn an enolate. Thermodynamic enolate and the more substituted double bond is when we make the double bond to the left, right? Because this double bond right here is more substituted than if we made it to the right. And that's because the smaller base can really wiggle in there, get that proton that is a little hard to get to, and we make the more stable double bond. Now, uh, on the other hand, we have a bigger, bulkier base, and whether you use LDA in your class or potassium terbutoxide or any big, bulky base, right, and the colder temperatures, you get that lesser substituted double bond because you go for the more accessible hydrogen, right, or a, a position with more accessible hydrogens, right? There's two of them, there's less steric hindrance involved, easier to get to, so then that's nothing much to it in terms of number two. I know if, if you're watching this video and you've done the practice beforehand, I'm sure kinetic and thermoenolates are nothing crazy for you. That does it for problem two. Let's move on to three. Rolling on into number three, we see we have this problem up here and we are tasked with drawing the arrow pushing mechanism to explain how this reactant goes to that product. Now, when I first saw this problem, gang, I was shook because I've never seen anything like it. So I thought it was so good, I wanted to include it on the practice test. So if we take a look up here, clearly we see two things that freak us out. One, we have nitrogen and then we don't have nitrogen. And two, we have a ring, a seven membered ring, which are impossible to draw. And then a straight line. So what happened here? Well, hopefully you can follow this gang because this is a crazy problem. I, I'll admit that. If you look at this ring up here, we have nitrogen, and then we have carbon, and then a double bond. Nitrogen, carbon, double bond. This is not only just an enamine. This is a double enamine. It's an enamine on both sides of the structure. So, I'll say this. If you can see that, then this problem is doable. If you can't see it, like, like at first, on a timed environment, which is so difficult sometimes to just have to see something or not, because the pressure is on. But if you can see the double enamine, I promise if you just go with your approach of looking at one of the double enamine, like one section, working with that double bond, unraveling it, recovering a carbonyl, and then doing it on the other side, you end up at the final product. So I'm gonna do that here. I'm gonna try and do this as quickly as possible to not make the video crazy long, and I'm going to try and save as much space because I don't want to run out. So. At first, what's the first thing that happens? Well, when you unravel an enamine, right, we need to recover our carbonyl and get, we need to get to a point where we can allow water to attack, right? So the first thing that's going to happen is this double bond is going to get protonated. And, or the way you can think about it is nitrogen swings down an electron pair and then this double bond goes and gets protonated. So after the first step of just protonation, Oh my goodness. I will say having to do this did get me a little bit better at drawing seven membered rings, but not a whole lot. So I didn't touch anything down here. So now we have the double bond here. And then we have a methyl. So you know nitrogen has a positive charge. And now that carbon just has a hydrogen. So really we've gone to a point where this is kind of where an enamine formation, you do all the imine related steps up to it, and then you do that E2 step, but now uh, we're going backwards, so the next thing that happens is water is reintroduced. Water comes in and attacks. Electrons kick up onto the nitrogen. So I'm gonna kind of step, actually I'll do this and then I'll go to work back here so I can go straight across. I wanted to use that space up top. So we have this. This is where it gets a little crowded. So we have nitrogen, whoops, right there, nitrogen right there, we have the methyl. Nitrogen has not a formal charge anymore, it has a lone pair. And now we have oxygen right up here with a positive charge itself, okay? So now in this step, right, we're kind of getting to the point where we wanna, we're working with this carbon and that's, this carbon will have a carbonyl on it with this oxygen being the carbonyl oxygen. 
So at this point, we want this to leave. So remember, we have to bring back our proton shuffle. We need to protonate what we want to leave and deprotonate what we want to stay. We want water to stay. So I'm going to bring the conjugate base of sulfuric acid, deprotonate that, and then I'm going to bring sulfuric acid in to protonate the nitrogen. I'll bring it down here to try and not make everything so cluttered. But then when we do that, we haven't touched this bottom part whatsoever. So now we have an OH up here. You know what, I'm even gonna switch the positioning to make this better. So I have the methyl over here. It doesn't matter that I switch the way that they're drawn. So we have a methyl and then we have a hydrogen plus charge on the nitrogen. So what's gonna happen here is we reform our carbonyl and in doing so, we break this bond. So we break our ring. We no longer have a ring at this point. So this can be very weird, confusing. So I'm gonna not number one, two, three, four, five, and six. So between, I'm not counting the methyl groups, but just between the you know the the methyl groups right here, we have six carbons total. So what we have is I'm gonna kind of draw this very similar, just so I don't lose my my brain, my mind. So one, two, three. Four, five, six, there we go. So we have this, I'm gonna draw this very similarly. And if I wanted to be really correct, because this should be an E double F, whatever, this could just stay. So that is kind of the first recovery of carbonyl and breakage of the ring. And I, okay, I actually forgot a hydrogen right here. So you can see we've recovered a carbonyl and you can start to see, so up here, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So now you can see a single enamine. You can already see one carbonyl. It's lining up with what we have in our product and the light is starting, you know, we're starting to see a light, an end of a tunnel. So at this step, what we need to do is just some, some proton cleanup. And if you wanna be slick, which is what I'm gonna do just because, it's not because I'm slick, it's just because I'm, I have board, whiteboard real estate is at a premium around here. I'm gonna deprotonate that because that will get cleaned up. But at the same time, I'm gonna get this process started on the bottom enamine. I'm going to do the same thing that I did up here. I'm gonna have this, this double bond, the carbon-carbon double bond, grab H plus and the electrons swing down the nitrogen, right? The whole, it's the whole process again. This, the first part was hard because this was kind of like, it's a ring, there's two of them, what's going on? So what I will do is I will bring sulfuric acid in yet again. Electrons swing down. Double bond grabs H plus. So now we're going over here. So now I'm going to draw this more in a straight line structure. So I'm going to do ME. So I know this is one, two, three, four, five, and six. So I know I have one, two, three, four, five, six. So this carbon right here, one, two, three, four, five, and six is the one that is part of the carbon carbon double bond. So I know I have a double bond to a nitrogen right now. I have a hydrogen, I have a methyl, and I know I also uh, no longer have a double bond there, and I have a, I'm forgetting something. Yeah, so I'm forgetting a methyl group right there. Okay, cool. So at this point, right, the nitrogen has a positive charge. So at this point, right, we can now bring water in to attack because this carbon right here, we can draw resonance, it has a positive charge on it, it is ready to be attacked. So in continuing this on, methyl double bond of one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Methyl group. Now we have an OH with a positive charge. Now we have a nitrogen with a methyl and a hydrogen. And that just has, it's neutral because it has that lone pair. And again, we're doing the proton shuffle. I want this gone. I want this to stay. I'm gonna protonate what I wanna keep. Sorry, I'm gonna protonate what I want to leave. I'm gonna deprotonate what I want to stay. So the nitrogen right here is going to pick up H plus from, you guessed it, sulfuric acid. And our lovely water will get deprotonated by the conjugate base of sulfuric acid. So I'm gonna work, and if you want to, you can do the plus H plus, the minus H plus, and then down here, we're getting close gang. This 
One, two, three, four, five, six. So down here is where we have all, oh, I have the methyl over here. Now I have all this action. I have the nitrogen with two hydrogens, a methyl, and then I have just an OH. This has a plus charge, one, two, three, four. So now the final reveal, we swing these down. We boot the amine off, we produce an amine. So if you want to, for bookkeeping, it's methylamine, Me NH2. We've gotten our nitrogen rascal out of there. And we're so, 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 so close. One, two, three, four, five, six. You can see plus charge, methyl. What you would do is just have something clean this up. I have effectively run out of space. But once you deprotonate this, you get the product at the top. I'll let you take that in for a second in case you want to screenshot it. But it is quite a lot of writing. And honestly, if you're looking at it, it's honestly just a lot of proton transfer. This is only confusing in that you go from, well, you know, we haven't really seen double enamines before, but you knew how to do this problem the moment we talked about enamine formation, forward and reverse. Okay, gang, that does it for three, on to four. Okay, gang, in problem four, we have a complete the reagent uh, section. So if we take a look up top here, I think what we can see, and this isn't a crazy problem, but we have a carboxylic acid and we see all we're doing here is ester formation, right? With, uh, you know, if you want to think about the ether section of the ester being in, like, you know, O-methyl, that's exactly what we need. So very straightforward, an additional elimination mechanism, but we don't have to show anything like that. You just need methanol and then you could throw in like H+, H3O+, if you wanted to put that up there, or you can feel free. So I used H3O+, on the answer sheet. But if you even wanted to throw in something more specific like H2SO4, as long as it is a non-nucleophilic acid, I mean non-nucleophilic is in like HCl is a nucleophilic acid because using it produces Cl minus. You could throw in H2SO4, it would work just as well. But that's it for the first one. Now down here for the second one, we can see we have a cis double bond, okay? Or even, you know, if you even want to call it a Z double bond, you could refer to that using the more generic terminology. We have a Vitic product over here, okay? That's when you see that double bond and, you know, carbon-carbon double bond made, whether it's, you know, E or Z, you, can, you, you might be able to accomplish it with a Vitic. So I chose to, you know, I, I saw that. I said, let me break this in half. I'm going to have to provide the other piece. So I thought, let me make this into the Yilid. So what I did first to make a Yilid, you need to have a halogen on there. So after the first step, I had propyl chloride, and then you need to throw in your triphenylphosphine, the PPH3, because the PPH3 does SN2, and the whole purpose of getting, whoops, I have all my carbon's good, that puts a positive charge on phosphorus, and then as a third step, you actually make the yield. I like to use LDA as my base, I know you could definitely use, uh, you know, butyl lithium, you could use AOH, potassium terbutoxide, whatever you want to use, whatever is relevant for your class. So in that third step, right, we get our Yilid in the form we know it, either in this form or in the form that I've also, I believe, used on the solutions. Is this right here? Oh, goodness gracious, too many Ps. P, pH3 with the charges, whatever form you want to use, that's totally fine. So that is, that is where we get this. And then it's in the fourth step right there that you want to bring in the carbonyl piece that you worked with. So you can see one, two, three, four. So we have four carbons and it's this carbon right here that was a carbonyl and it needs to be either a ketone or an aldehyde. Here, it's an aldehyde. So that is, you know, if I'm gonna, I'll just make sure you, that is the answer for the second question. So down here in three. So you can see we have a carbonyl vanish and the double bonds remain intact. Hopefully this is triggering your Wolf Kishner senses. So I know you've seen me draw the Wolf Kishner in a variety of uh, kind of condition ways, but this is a very common way to write it right here is if you have heat, hydroxide, and you can even write water right here, or, you know, maybe not water. I, maybe I don't have that. I don't have that on the sheet. Okay. So if you have this, this just screams doing the Wolf Kishner, you know, it's going to focus in on ketones and aldehydes and it will remain, it will, or it will, you know, look beyond double bonds. It is not, you know, double bond sensitive, okay? 
So finally, down here, hopefully what you see is we start with an enone, and then hopefully, I mean, obviously we see two six-membered rings, but I think you can start to piece, you know, you see this ethyl group right here. You even see, you know, the two carbons right here. You even see a carbonyl right here. This, I hope, is sending Robinson annulation vibes to you because we do form a six-membered ring, and, you know, at least we see this part, which was not a part of a ring, now is a part of a ring over there. Okay, so how do we pick this apart? So remember, this bond you absolutely, absolutely, absolutely cut, right? We know that one, two, three, there must have been an OH here. There must have been the second part, the aldol condensation part of our Robinson annulation. This carbon right here does not belong to this piece right here, okay? because we obviously have the enone form and that happened with the OH that was created from the aldol uh, reaction uh, and drove it off creating the condensation and the, you know, the double bond we see there. So I also think you can see we have these two carbons, these two carbons, and then one carbon up here, one carbon away, we see the ethyl group. So I think it's even really easy to say one, two, three, four, and five. One, two, three, four, and five. This piece is that piece over there. So I think we can even safely extend this up here because it's carbon two that would be attacked in an additional, sorry, in, in like in an initial Michael addition, right? It's this carbon right here that could have attacked this carbon over here. So hopefully this makes a little sense. If we have a first step where I have a carbonyl here and I have LDA, what the LDA will do is we will create an enolate over here, okay? We'll create an enolate this way, we'll attack up here, connect those two together, and then it's this carbon down here, which I'll asterisk this, I'll asterisk that. That is the carbonyl that ends up getting attacked when this product ends up forming an enolate and attacking over here, and then if we have a second step of NaOH, water, and heat, we then proceed to the Robinson annulation. So make that cut that we've done before, trust yourself, and that is how you would film the reagent for this Robinson annulation. Okay gang, so that does it for problem four. We just have two more, so stick with me. Let's go on to five. Okay gang, approaching problem five, you see it is yet another mechanism, and I'm sorry, I know I'm pummeling you with mechanisms, but just couldn't resist this chapter, you know, this, this unit has so many good mechanisms. So with this reaction up here, again, we probably have a what the heck type reaction because we see we just have a straight chain structure. You know, we see we have two esters and then we'll all of a sudden it, uh, you know, a ring seemingly out of nowhere. But this is where, you know, an instance where the molecular relationships that result uh, from the reactions we've learned come in very handy because while this looks absolutely crazy. If we take a look in the product, I hope what you're seeing is this. It's really easy to get lost in the fact that there are, you know, two oxygens embedded in this ring and there's a double bond and, you know, it's all mangled, but there is an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. There's an enone, right? So if I'm going to just draw on the experience of from the reactions that we've learned, this to me is looking like an intramolecular aldol reaction and condensation. And if you take a look at the conditions, that makes total sense. We just have acid, right? And if what even you know, we form a six-member ring. So if you catch on to that, then you realize, okay, well, I can't even make an enol to the left of this carbonyl to the right of this carbonyl, there's some, it's symmetrical, so it doesn't even matter which one I work with. Let's just say, hypothetically, I form an enol this way. One, two, three, four, five, and look at that. That carbon attacking the other carbonyl, whether you're working with either carbonyl, forms a six-membered ring. So, to get started, we know we need to protonate we need to, you know, we need to form an enol, and to be consistent with my um, my solution, it's this. So I'm actually going to everything I just did up on here. I'm going to do on this side. So the first thing I need to do is actually protonate this oxygen up here. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to just have this 
up here, or protonate. So now we're starting just because I only have so much whiteboard. So once we have this, right, you can even bring the water back. This is really just enol formation. I could have even done this in one step, but I think I wanted to be very explicit about how this worked just in case. Uh, you know, you just saw an enol appear, you were like, whoa, where'd that come from? So, now we have our lovely enol. So, we need to actually prep this for attack, and we could have probably protonated this at some point. You know what, I'm even going to retroactively kind of cheat and do that. So, I'm going to just have this oxygen also get protonated, just so at this point in time, now this is protonated. And we can just, again, so I can save space. I'll have these electrons swing down. I'll have this carbon. Remember, it's that carbon that controls the carbon-carbon uh, double bond electrons, right? We attack, electrons kick up to the oxygen. And remember, counting is your friend. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So when we go to draw a ring, I, I just like to draw a hexagon. I know that there are oxygens embedded in it. I know I'm gonna kinda of have to erase a little bit, but I know for a fact if I have this in place, I'm going to be able to easily place the oxygens and I won't feel you know, pressured or stuck trying to draw this ring and fill everything in at the same time. So on carbon number one, you can see we have a methyl group, right? It's this methyl group right here. Then on two is where we have the carbonyl that still has a proton, so it has a positive charge. And then it's on through, so here, let me do this. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So it's on three that we have an oxygen. So, you know, I know I'm using a whiteboard, but just erase on your paper with, um, and then put an oxygen, you know, erase, put an oxygen there if you're using a pen, just really right over it, who cares? Nothing on four, on five, same situation. There's the second oxygen that's embedded in our ring. And then on six, we have two things. We have an ethyl group. Let me draw that a little bit better. I'll draw it bent this way. And then we have an O. H. Okay. Now, again, this is going to go to a condensation. So again, I'm going to cheat a little bit in this for this step right here. I'm going to deprotonate this and then I'm going to protonate this. So I will have water come in and then I will have hydronium over here. So we still have our ethyl group. Now we have OH2 plus. We have just a regular old carbonyl. I think I feel I have my methyl group, I have my ethyl. You can see we're so close to what we actually need. And then at this point, right, we need to actually do the condensation, form this double bond. So I'm going to expose this hydrogen. I'm going to bring in a water from over here. Water grabs the hydrogen in a very E2-like fashion. We swing the electrons down, we form the double bond. That will be a problem for this carbon if we don't do anything, we'll break the octet rule. So we boot off water, we fill our, you know, we actually proceed with the condensation, and then we finally see our lovely product right here. Honestly, after the double enamine, this seems like a breeze. Okay, gang, so no more mechanisms. We have one last problem, a synthesis problem. Keep rocking with me, we're so close. Number six, here we come. Okay, gang, to round out this exam walkthrough, to speed through this last problem, to make, uh, to hopefully make an, a very long video a little bit shorter, we have this synthesis problem. So ignore everything in the middle and we'll talk about it. So you know the first thing we do on Jochem is count our carbons. So here we have a source of four carbons. Here we have a source of one carbon. And in our product, our target molecule, we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine carbons total. So to make our lives easier, I think it makes sense to use two of the four carbon pieces to make eight and just one of the one carbon pieces to get nine. So then if we take a look over back, you know, shift our focus back to the target molecule, this is where our molecular relationships become so, 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 so important in terms of reactions that produce these relationships to figure out what is our big step here. So hopefully what you're seeing one is one, two, three, four, and five. Yep, that's right. This is a 1,5 dicarbonyl, and we know what makes those Michael additions, right? We're talking enolate, attacking alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl in a 1,4 fashion, aka a Michael addition. 
So we need to figure out how to make a convenient cut to then start working backwards. So if we take a look at the target molecule, hopefully what you can see is there's a kind of a connection, right? That's alpha to this carbonyl right here. So let me just hypothetically cut that and see if that would be convenient for me. So we would get a one, two, three, four, five piece and a one, two, three, four piece. And I think that's pretty good because we'll obviously, there's no way we'll get around having another connecting step. We're gonna have to have two. But at least this way, we can work this back directly to our four carbon source. And there we can work with this to combine a four carbon piece with a one carbon piece. So that's the cut I think we should make. So if we cut this, that is the culmination of this step right here, okay? So you can see one, two, three, four, and more, but you know, specifically, what was the alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone here? And you can see one, two, three, four. That is how I took, you know, and recreated my enone uh, going backwards. And what was the enolate? Well, it's very clear that this was the nucleophilic alpha carbon. Luckily, we're symmetrical here. So it's, yeah, that's why the double bond is going between the carbonyl, what was the carbonyl carbon and that carbon labeled four in the target molecule. So going backwards, let's start with this piece right here. So we had an enolate. Well, how did we get it? Well, we have carbonyls and then we do alpha deprotonation. Uh, you don't even honestly need conditions here. I just threw them in. I wanted to put them here to be consistent with the solution, but really you just need a base. Sodium hydroxide, LDA, potassium terbutoxide, they all work. So at this point, how did we get this carbonyl right here? Well, this is kind of, diff not difficult, but we had to have connected these pieces together. And I hope what you can see is it's really, you know, and I chose to do it one way. You could definitely do it a different way. Uh, but I, you know, and more honestly, we could have done this with SN2. But what I thought we could do here is actually have an aldol condensation, right? So if we step this back with H2PEC, there was a double bond here. It wasn't, it's not present here. But if we step this back with H2PEC, we could have a double bond here. And what we could really easily do is have PCC make this an aldehyde. We can have this enolate right here. I should have heat here. Uh, but if we cut this right here, this could be a one carbon piece. This is obviously the one, two, three, a one, two, three, four carbon piece right here. And we could have an aldol reaction, which then goes to a condensation right here. So at first we would have this, a one, three hydroxycarbonyl with the heat and sodium hydroxide and water would drive it to the condensation. Or another thing you could do is you could very easily use PBR3, make this CH3BR, and then use the enolate to do SN2 on this to get to here as well. Honestly, that's a better pathway. I made this solution a long time ago, but the SN2 route, honestly, the better way to go. I'll make sure to reflect that on the solution. So at this point, right, whether you do the condensation and double bond reduction or hydrogenation or the SN2 route, what's next? So we still need to explain where this comes from, right? So we can see we're super close because there's an alcohol and this, you know, we have sec butyl alcohol right here. So to get this enolate, we would need kinetic conditions here. You can step that back. And then to get from here to here, you just need to oxidize whether you use Jones conditions or PCC, that's up to you. And then over here, to get from to get this right here, we can take that same secondary ketone. We can brominate because there's only one brom secondary carbon in this molecule. Bromine's super picky. We know with certainty it's going to go here. And then you can do elimination, form that four atom conjugated system, which is very favorable and will happen. Sets up the Michael addition at the end. Gang, thank you for sticking with me on this long exam walkthrough. Uh, good luck on your test if you're watching to this point. And if you're also watching to, to, watching to this point, I just want to say thank you. You've obviously finan uh, financially supported Joe Chem. You've watched the videos. You rock. Thanks for watching. I hope Joe Chem has been the tool you were hoping to find to fuel you, fuel you to organic success. I'm so happy you're using it right now. I hope you're using it until the end of your carbon career. And no matter what, I hope to see you all in the next video.